next up, we've got Mikhail from Denuvo, who you can see. Yay, look at that, right there. Uh, one of our wonderful sponsors who's going to be talking about uh, Cheetah's Secrets Unveiled, um, how cheetahs operate in mobile games and how you counteract them. Hi, how are you, Mikhail? Hey, Sophie, I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Thanks. Where are you coming at us from? Where are you based at the moment? Well, I share Jeff's pain. He had a really great talk and I'm actually calling from Ottawa, Canada, which is a little bit early on our side. It's 4 a.m. here, uh, but I've been <laughs> watching the uh, I've been watching the Pocket Gamer Connect recording, so I'm actually really excited to do a live session. Oh, well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. And again, for being with us in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, I can't explain how grateful we are. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I... I won't keep you too long. I will let you get on. Um, so what I will do is while you're sharing your screen, getting everything sorted, I'm going to remind everyone to uh, throw your questions into the Q&A for Mikhail because I'll be back at the end and we'll go through all of your questions. Um, but once again, I would just like to say a huge massive, massive thank you to Mikhail as well for being up so early. So um, yes, that is uh, that deserves applause and I hope you've got your copy charged. I'm looking forward to the question. So thank you for doing that. Oh, no worries at all. Yeah. So um, um, do you have any slides or anything like that? I do. I'll start sharing in just a second. Yeah. I just wanted yeah, to sure. give a super quick intro and then I'll head right into oh, it. Perfect. Well, in that case, what I will do is it sounds like you're all sorted. So I will drift off into the background, but I'll be here if you need me and I'll be back at the end for the Q&A. Thanks so much, Sophia. See you soon. Hi everyone, my name is Mikhail Grushyshev. I'm a product manager at Denuvo and their anti-cheat solution. So today I have an exciting topic for you and that's uh, cheater secrets in video games and advice on how to counteract them. Uh, we have a massive amount of content to cover in just 20 minutes, um, but before I hop into it and go on my verbal diarrhea terrain, just a few words about the fine folks uh, that brought me here before you. Uh, the organization on the right, the Nuvo Bayardetto, is the organization for which I'm a product manager at. They're the world's number one games protection platform, and you might know them for their anti-tamper solution on PC, where their objective is to secure the launch window of games. And today we have an unprecedented 160-day crack-free window, uh, which I'm really proud of uh, the team for delivering. We protected over a thousand games, which equates just over two billion unique game installs. Um, and yeah, <laughs> we feel like we're really the experts in the industry on this side. Our parent organization is Erdetto. Uh, they've protected more than six billion devices and applications to date. This is everything from the operating system that's running in your car to the UEFA match uh, that went on just a few days ago. So there are uh, many, many security threats that mobile games will face. Um, but today I'd like to focus on just four of them um, for the sake of fitting into 20 minutes. Uh, the first one being uh, cracked premium games um, that have all their content unlocked. So essentially piracy or free games that have hijacked monetization. Um, with the ability to create tampered versions of applications, you then enable malicious redistribution. So this is when games are used as vehicles to distribute malware or steal credentials. And in this case, it doesn't have to be just games, it could be applications. Maybe somebody doesn't want to pay for the premium cost of Photoshop, so they try to find a free version. And then when they sign into Creative Cloud from there, um, little do they know that the app has actually hijacked their credentials. Uh, service infrastructure attacks. Uh, so this is a class of attacks like denial of service, um, data theft due to poor security or vulnerabilities, and headless farming which is essentially when an online service believes it's talking to a mobile client, but in reality is just talking to one of a thousand threads on some machine pretending to be a real life client. And finally, I think the key focus of this talk, the client side cheating portion. So this is software like bots, scripts, and trainers, um, either to uh, remove the need for a player to spend money on in-game offline monetization or in the worst case, uh, to ruin the experience of players uh, playing in competitive multiplayer games. In uh, May 2020, uh, we analyzed the top 50 games on the Google Play Store with the objective to discover what does the cheating landscape look like. And we did this by scanning 64 cracking and cheating sites for cheats and hacks. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered was that 86% of the games in the top 50 had a cheat available. And of those that were available, were actually up to date to the latest version. So this means you can download an app from the Google Play Store and then most of the time find a cheat that is already updated to work with the latest app. 
Mm -hmm. uh, these cheats were delivered in two forms. Uh, the first form was a version that is uh, in which the app is already tampered with the cheat or hack already pre-installed. So you would be downloading a tampered application that already has the cheat software built in. And the other one would be delivered as a client-side hack, uh, most of the times a memory editor, um, which work on a pristine version of the game. So this means you can go to the App Store, download um, the pristine version of the app, and then use a third-party uh, tool to then uh, cheat or otherwise hack the app. So let's take a look at how these tampered apps are created and how these memory editors are created. Uh, apologize for the grain, not sure why I did that. <laughs> so the tampering process for uh, Android and iOS is actually the same. And the process is you analyze the application to find the coder data to patch. You would then change the coder data uh, in the application, resign it and re redeploy it to the device. But of course the devil is in the details. So let's find out how this is done. So the first step to creating uh, a tempered app is to analyze it. And to analyze it, you first have to unpack it. So on Android, this process is quite trivial. Um, you can use command line tools like APK tool or full featured editors like APK Editor Studio. And from the screenshot, you can see I loaded up Ed Editor Studio, threw in VLC for Android in there. And then on my Windows operating system, I now have um, a file system, the files that were uh, packed in the APK. On iOS, this is significantly more challenging. So you can use basic archive tools like 7-zip to unpack the IPAs, uh, but the binaries would then require decryption. And for all intents and purposes, it's actually much easier to use tools like Clutch and Dump iOS to dump the decrypted binaries directly from memory. But this then requires a jailbroken device on which to run these tools. And this jailbroken device requires some communication channel like OpenSSH. So assuming you got past the hurdle of dumping uh, the application uh, package, um, you then need to analyze it to find targets of interest. So there are many static analysis tools. Um, in this case, I will use IDA Pro in a few of our examples, but the goal is to explore and find interesting coder data to patch. So in the above screenshot is uh, data that is interesting, and that's the advertiser ID that's used in a free-to-play game. So if I were to patch this uh, advertiser ID and then redistribute the Stanford application, anytime a player plays the game, the revenue would now be funding me, uh, the hacker and the cracker, uh, instead of the original game developer. And this is an example of modifying game data. And then the second example, I took the DEX file, converted it to Smalley, uh, which for all intents and purposes is Java. And then um, we can see that there are code uh, logic responsible for validating if a premium version of the application is unlocked or not. And here you can patch the code and essentially uh, pirate the application by gaining access to premium features uh, without paying for it. So both of these examples are um, very cheat related. So I have one specific to creating uh, tamper cheats. So this is a shark game um, that we've loaded into Ida Pro. And we have two functions that are interesting right near the bottom called shark stats, get currency and get premium currency. And if in Ida Pro we navigate to these functions, we get the uh, ARM assembly instructions that are behind it. I don't have an ARM assembler in my head. So here's the uh, kind of <laughs> code representation of it. On the left is the original code. And the idea is this get currency function has some original game code that's invoked and eventually returns the currency. But in the patched example, we put an instruction right at the beginning that just returns some obscenely large currency value and ignores the rest of the game functionality. And if we go back to the assembly code, you can kind of see in the patched version, it loads into the register an obscenely large value and then immediately jumps out. Whereas in the original version, you execute the original code. Um, and the way this looks like in game is in the shark game, no matter what the game does to increase or decrease the currency value, the function will always return the static version that we, a static value that we now patched in. Super simple example, but I hope that that part made sense. So we covered um, how to actually tamper and patch the application, but how do you repack it for redistribution? Well, the repacking step actually follows the regular archive and creation and deployment process. So for iOS, there's a provisioning step. For uh, Android is the app uh, uh, APK signing step. 
um, and resigning uh, the apps, enable resubmission to app stores. And this is how you end up with these cloned and copycat apps, which are essentially the original um, version of the application with a few assets either changed or stripped and then republished um, to steal revenue from the original developer. And on Android specifically, uh, re-signing an application reduces the effort to sideload the app onto a tampered, uh, sorry, sideload a tampered app onto a device since Android is a lot happier loading uh, signed applications and unsigned applications. Mm -hmm. And once distributed, this is where the damages begin. So before that, really, if somebody wants to go through this process and modify the app for themselves, they can knock themselves out. Um, but once it's been distributed, uh, this is where the danger starts. So cheats built into tempered apps um, reduce in-app purchases. Um, once you have a tempered app that gives you unlimited coins, why would you purchase premium currency? Um, and more importantly, the will damage legitimate players' multiplayer experience if your game has a competitive multiplayer. So tempered apps have their monetization vehicles hijacked. So this doesn't just mean you lose your stream of revenue, but instead that stream is redirected to fund future hacking efforts. And crack premium apps will of course reduce the amount of premium purchases through the app store. Um, if I can avoid spending two or three bucks, maybe that will be enough to motivate someone to go find the app for free on Pirate Bay or something like this. And finally, kind of a hidden danger and a hidden cost is the increased support effort and brand damage as a result to users working with cracking apps. Oftentimes a user will not be able to tell if an issue with an app is because of a crack or because of the base product. And essentially you begin to rack up overhead um, through the cracked apps that are available out in the wild. So we just covered the left side portion, which is the 84% of apps um, that had tampered copies floating around. Um, next up, I want to talk about the 22% that are hacked using um, client-side tools like memory editors. And just a reminder, the difference between the two is on the left, you're publishing an application with the hacks already applied. And on the right, you're working with a pristine application and instead using a third-party uh, tool to interact with it. So how are apps attacked by memory editors? Well, to begin, they have two requirements. The first is you need the actual third-party tool, like a memory editor, to interact with the application. And the second one is a big one, and memory editor needs to have um, elevated privileges to actually interact with the application. And for all intents and purposes on modern Android and iOS, this is not possible without a rooted device. Uh, the permission levels cannot be granted to regular sandbox applications uh, running. So assuming these requirements are met, then this enables the hacker to attach a memory editor to the application, uh, look for sensitive coder data, alter that coder data, and then publish a script that essentially automates step one to three so millions of other users can do the same. This is what this looks like. So on the left, I have a game in which a character has 600 hit points. Uh, the character, uh, the, the next step would be to open up the memory editor and search for the value 600. And essentially the memory editor will go through the process and returns all the memory regions that have the value 600 in them. Um, hint, there's gonna be hundreds if not thousands um, since there's nothing that unique about this value. Uh, the next step is to then run around in the game, take a little bit of damage and you can see the player's health has now been reduced to 480. So we go back to the memory editor and input 480. This is where a little bit of the secret sauce happens. Um, it now takes the values that used to be 600 and checks which ones have reduced to 480. And this is an event that's rare enough that it could figure out that, hey, there's only one memory region that had this type of behavior. And it so happens to be the memory region responsible for representing the character's hit points. The memory editor can then um, freeze this value. Um, this is an option on the left. But on the right, you can now see a character taking repeating, repeated damage and the game engine is struggling to properly decrement the character's hit points. And for all intents, intents and purposes, the character is now uh, invulner invulnerable. So the, the, the cheater has given himself invincibility. Now, while these steps are easy to execute for an individual, uh, this isn't very easy to <laughs> distribute to millions. So this is kind of where hacking scripts come in. And I have an example from Battle Legion, which is a game um, that had a hack before Denuvo came along. Um, this hack enables a cheater to receive instant wins. 
So as soon as the match is found, uh, it accelerates the match countdown timer for it to start instantly. And then without moving any units, uh, the match is declared a victory for the player. So as you can imagine, this is probably not incentivizing the player to purchase any in-game uh, purchases and the player they're playing against is probably having a terrible experience. So I, I think we're all on the same page that, yep, um, these are definitely not positive things about mobile app development. Uh, what can we do with, about them? So there's three categories of recommendations that I would have for all app developers, regardless if it's games or business applications, and that's to follow security by design, um, be diligent and uh, provide passive prevention, and then in the most extreme cases, consider active detection. So what do these mean? Security by design, I'm hoping everybody's uh, aware of at least the basics, and that's shift as much of your critical logic as you can to the server. So this means don't trust the client with um, critical decisions or decisions that um, may be uh, modified by the client. When the server is communicating with the client, don't trust it. So don't pass it any data that you would, you would have wanted to reveal. So for example, if you're creating a battleship game and you have a list of units that the player owns and a list of units that the enemy owns, um, don't send the positions of the enemy's units because the cheating client will reveal those positions to the cheater. Um, and they will not respect any uh, hidden or invisibility properties that you would then try to enforce on the client. Um, kind of an obvious one is secure the server APIs. So uh, make sure your access rules are correct. You're validating the client input that's being sent to the server. Uh, implement throttling and limits, have proper access tokens and expiration values, uh, rotate your API keys and monitor your API key usage. Um, Honestly, the security by design is probably a multi-day talk all on its own. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that uh, for now. Next up is passive prevention. So this is uh, making it hard for an attacker to understand what to attack. Uh, and this is often done by applying obfuscation. The objective is to hide important data and game state and uh, delay the amount of time it takes for an attacker to understand and essentially update or create a cheat for the hack uh, for the app. So this will not prevent hacking attempts, but it will certainly slow them down. And finally, for the most extreme of cases, um, you'll want to move into active detection. So that's making sure that the code running in your application is not running uh, from a tampered state. So the app uh, executing the code has not been tampered. Um, you want to impede debugging and hooking attempts, which will prevent those memory editors uh, that work on pristine applications. And in some cases, you want to perform root detection. So making sure your application is running on a trusted environment. So doing all three of these from scratch, uh, I could imagine would be extremely daunting. I mean, uh, obfuscation, you could probably find off the shelf solution for these, but doing things like uh, verifying the integrity of your application without killing battery life is challenging to do properly. Uh, impeding debugging and hooking requires expert level platform knowledge to understand how platforms offer this functionality. Um, and doing things like root detection is really an endless game of cat and mouse because as soon as you create a detection method, uh, the cheaters and hackers will find out how to uh, circumvent it or patch it. So this is really where Duo's expertise comes in. Um, as I mentioned, um, on the PC, we've had incredible success with our 160-day crack-free window. And we took this technology, uh, took the learnings we had from the platform, and we brought it to the mobile space. Um, so we're very excited to offer the new mobile app protection. The exciting thing here is our integration process. Um, it essentially requires, well, not essentially, it does require no game modification, no game source code modification. So you would take your fully built iOS or Android application. After the APK has been created, you submit it to us for encryption using a tool we provide that integrates into your CI pipeline. And once the tool returns the encrypted version of your application, you would then go through your regular review, staging, and publishing process. And at the end of the day, your application will now ship with integrity verification, ensuring that there's no tampered version of your application floating around. Uh, it has the anti-debugging functionality, which will prevent memory editors and tools used to analyze or dump game code. Uh, hook detection, so for these frameworks that I showed with Battle Legion that will enable easy things like patching for an instant win. 
Uh, optionally, you have the ability for your application to react to jailbreak or root detection. So if it detects this, maybe you would like alternative flow in your app and only certain features be available to users not running on trusted platforms. And finally, a feature that we're very excited for, and that's our emulator detection and the ability to tell you when we're running in a trusted emulated environment um, versus one in which you should take caution. And uh, part of this comes the mobile telemetry. So this is an optional portion um, if your application has an online component. And the purpose of the mobile telemetry is to get real-time insights into hacking and cheating attempts, which are absolutely critical to securing multiplayer online games. So if you notice a player cheating mid-match with mobile telemetry, you can then kick a player from the match um, or take whatever action uh, you would prefer. Uh, maybe you put them on a cheater island where they only play with other cheaters, or maybe you revoke their online access entirely. It's really up to you. And of course, this mobile telemetry is accessible via APIs and has an integration with every major uh, game platform. So finally, Pocket Gamer uh, is really a conference for indies. Um, and we absolutely love indies. And by this, we mean, one, the solution is affordable. Um, it's just easy to implement, which is perfect for small teams. I mean, you already have 12 hour work days. Uh, this is one less thing to worry about once it's integrated. And the revenue model for us uh, implies that we only succeed when you succeed. Um, and we have an awesome recommendation from Traplight, the developers of Battle Legion. We've been on their game for almost a year now. And ever since they introduced a new mobile protection, uh, they have not had any cracks or hacks and the game is protected to date. So we're very proud of the work we did for them. And we're looking forward to working with more of these in the future. So I really ap apologize for the pace of that presentation. <laughs> I know it's kind of rushed and there's a lot of content to cover, but I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions and this would be a great time to ask your questions now. Thanks a lot. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yes, well, like you say, we've got a couple of questions. So uh, yeah, of course, I'd like to say a massive thank you for the talk. And uh, should we dive into the questions? Please do, looking forward to it. Fab, so the first one I've got, I'm just gonna, pick them out, maybe do them in reverse order this time. Uh, does Denuvo also take into consideration devices that are older and slower when doing the checks or, and will that have any influence over the performance? I mean, obviously there's yeah. markets like, like, you know, around the world that utilize, you know, not the latest hardware for playing games. Yeah, absolutely. So on PC testing um, for the anti-tamper solution, the performance testing it was really heavily focused on frame rates, frame times, and kind of the perceivable performance that the users will see. But once we move on to the mobile space, the performance requirements escalated significantly. So we take a look at things like impact to battery life, CPU usage, memory consumption, because we found all of these variables are so much more significant on a mobile device than a PC platform. So yes, the majority of our test farm is older devices because these devices are more sensitive to uh, these type of performance impacts. And the type of metrics we collect is things like battery life, memory usage, um, CPU consumption, et cetera. Okay, fantastic. Uh, tick that one off, there we go. Um, how often should we perform integrity verifications and root detections? Oh, <laughs> so maybe I'll start with the latter one. So the root detection really depends on how, um, how much of a requirement it is for your application to be running on a device that is trusted. So oftentimes for things like banking applications that wanna take advantage of some of the potential hardware security features, uh, oftentimes they'll perform root detection to make sure they're running on a trusted environment just to dot their I's and cross their T's. But oftentimes it is actually acceptable for games to be running on emulated devices because maybe players just prefer playing from their desktop on a full screen using keyboard and mouse, and this is perfectly fine. Um, so it really depends on what type of game is being played and for what reason. I imagine if you have a competitive game being played for a large amount of esports money and you really want everybody on a fair playing field, you probably want to enforce that for this match, everybody's playing from the same device just so nobody has an unfair advantage. But for your casual gamer, maybe ignore the um, uh, uh, emulator detection and allow these devices to work as is. And then the first part of that question was about how frequently should you perform integrity verification? I mean, th there is no simple 
like, hey, do it every five seconds. <laughs> it's really do yeah. it frequently enough to ensure the security of your application. And the technology that we build in is smart enough to only run the integrity verification when it deems necessary. So it's not like it's sitting there just scanning your app over and over and over. That's a really naive approach. That's not how it's done and under the hood. Yeah. Okay, and next that we've got, when dealing with uh, hacking, what is your advice for best protecting the player's data as a leak could create a trust issue in the long term? Um, so Denuvo is actually based in Salzburg, Austria, uh, in the EU, and they're under the GDPR regulations. And we found that actually going through the conformance process to make sure we are compliant with GDPR and the California Rights Privacy Act um, was a good framework to review our internal policy for how data is being transferred and protected. So my recommendation would be actually verify if your organization conforms with those uh, price, uh, uh, privacy rights and regulations. And yes. this will actually also force you to go through the process of making sure that data is secure. Fantastic. We've got two questions left. Hopefully we can get through them both. I think we will. Um, would you advise indie developers working with solutions like Denuvo from the start? Like, would you advise working from the start um, to have security already in place set in the design? Or is this something that's best to be done afterwards? So basically it's like, would you design the game with that add in Denuvo in mind? Or is it something that's equally suitable to add in later on? So I, the solution is really built in mind where somebody doesn't have any time available and last minute they need to apply a solution. Okay. Um, but by all means, that doesn't mean that's the optimal way to use it. So yeah. as I mentioned, for example, with the mobile telemetry where you have the ability to see if somebody's cheating, cheating in real time, uh, I think if ahead of time a developer knew they had an ability to create an experience from that type of functionality, they can really design the multiplayer experience around that um, and add the necessary UI elements to maybe notify other players that a cheater has been detected and kind of proactively build an experience around that. There's value from it. Uh, but if there is no time to allocate to security and really the focus of the game developer should be making an awesome game experience, uh, the solution is more than usable last minute and applied as is. Ah, fantastic yeah uh, next up is when dealing with um well it says here when dealing with for example chinese markets that um are known for you know sometimes controlling how your game is approached can be difficult um is using anti-tamper solutions enough or should we take additional measures so i had an interesting slide in the deck that i removed um because <laughs> in order to cut time but we did find that more more than 86 percent of tampered applications actually came from china so to us this was we, we heard the situation was bad but we did not quite know uh, how bad it was over there so the anti tamper solution does work in that region and it works by sandboxing that region that means any data from china stays in china and vice versa um, and from the experience we had so far protecting applications there is yes, it is more than enough. So anti-tamper has protected, uh, sorry, the new mobile protection has protected mobile apps in China um, with them remaining uncracked so far for nine months, because that's how long the solution has been out on the commercial space. Um, and we're hoping that nine months just extends even further. But right now we don't see any uh, evidence of increased hacking in China versus other regions once mobile protection is applied. Fantastic. And last question we've got, we've got actually got one more in, is from Brian, who is the editor of PocketGamer.biz. I said, do you find that developers tend to offload all responsibility for data security, privacy, et cetera, to publishing partners, or are they dealing with it themselves? Um, it's a mix. Um, oftentimes, organizations that have the resources to dedicate to data privacy and just security of their organization in general uh, do want to maintain ownership and control of that data flow. And at the end of the day, in the regulations, they are then the data processor and the data controller. But oftentimes, um, we'll deal with organizations that say, listen, guys, we just really want you to own this problem for us and use you as a white glove service. And in this case, we have a document that states we become the data controller, we become the data processor. And from a regulation 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 standpoint, uh, that onus and responsibility legally falls on us. So it's really a mixed bag. And I would say in most cases, um, we're handed the bag to deal with the problem. Uh, and in rare cases, the organization has the security effort to maintain uh, the data themselves. Fantastic. Well, that's we got through all the questions as well. And we're bang on time. So thank you so much, Ricard. Thank you for sharing all of that 
insight uh, with us. And uh, hopefully a lot of the people in the audience found that vastly interesting if they didn't already know about you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sophie. I had a great time. Oh, thank, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And <laughs> like, like, like I said before, um, go get some coffee or go to bed or whatever it is you're doing next. Go relax and enjoy. <laughs> I know. Have a great time, Bye. everyone. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, like I say, uh, another another uh, speaker pulling double duty there. So thank you so much. Thank you to Mikhail.